Hello, Doug. Welcome to K7 Project Bluebird. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Back in uh, November uh, 1964, you were a 34 year old living in Barmer and were employed by the Department of Lands as an inspector of leases in their irrigation branch, I believe. What did your work involve? All about 50 50 field work and office work, um, inspection of properties, and of course, the reports that emanated from that, all to do with irrigation or plantings or whatever. Yeah, so you you would uh, actually check the survey of some properties occasionally? Yeah, yes, occasionally. A um, fair bit of um, uh, measuring of plantings and things that were being established, that type of thing. You had a sort of fairly technical grasp, although not necessarily the qualifications of, of a uh, surveyor. Oh, surveying qualifications are pretty detailed. Uh, what we did was pretty well around the periphery, but uh, was adequate for our purpose. I guess in a case of serendipity, you were at home one morning when you had a knock at the, uh, the door, uh, which actually led to your meeting uh, the legendary speed ace, Donald Campbell. Who was it that came to your front door and uh, how did uh, that all come about? By name, Mike, I don't recall at all. Would have been one of the Campbell team. Um, but uh, they were interested in relocating the course and simply asked me if I could uh, check what they did. I guess somebody had told them that uh, we did a little bit of minor survey stuff up at the office and uh, hence yours truly was thrown in at the deep end. So that actually had a course plotted on Lake Bonnie for the uh, um, start of the attempt for the world record and they were wanting to move that. Where were they wanting to move it to? Well, the thing was uh, Lake Bonnie always was uh, really absolute minimum length for what Campbell wanted and um, he thought that by moving the course fractionally to the east he could then um, come in from uh, keeping in mind of course the course was running from uh, south to north he could come in from the west or southwest corner of the lake get the boat up on the plane running parallel with the town foreshore and swing onto the course and in doing so gain a couple of hundred yards. It wasn't much, but it was the little bit that was going to make the difference, he thought. We're on the foreshore of Lake Bonnie now, and uh, just to explain to those people that um, ha I guess would have a little bit of knowledge about the layout of uh, Barmer and the lake, where uh, perhaps on the southern bank where we are, would the uh, starting point or, or the, uh, I guess, southern access of this course be? I've got an idea it would have been roughly about where the town jetty is now down that way somewhere because I again uh, the recollection I have is that we moved it to uh, uh, running from about where the Boy Scout Hall is uh, so we only moved it you know 150 maybe a couple of hundred yards. The course how was that actually laid out um, what what comprised the course itself? Well originally uh, the course was laid parallel to their timing equipment that was set up on the eastern shore. Um, in moving it, uh, which was done by a prismatic compass, in moving it uh, you either got it exactly on the same bearing as it was originally, but if there was any slight deviation it was going to fractionally extend of course the course. So from purposes of uh, the breaking the record, the moving of the course, um, if anything, was to be to Campbell's, um, what shall we say, detriment, rather than uh, giving him any advantage. So the uh, measured mile might have been a yard or two longer? Yeah, it could have been, could have been fractionally longer, yes. Meant he had to do the same little fraction longer, perhaps to achieve his stated objective. You were talking about the timing points that obviously they needed to, to measure his speed over that mile. Um, whereabouts were those timing points located? Oh, they were all long gone. They were pylons out there at once. They just steel um, um, windmill type tower things. But uh, um, 
I'm trying to think exactly where they were. Um, they would have been about, the roughly, side. roughly about, um, oh, I'd say from a half, two thirds of the way along, half the course beyond. After you'd um, checked the accuracy of the new course, did the bluebird do a run that day at all? Yeah, I seem to recollect that it did. Um, I thought it got up something like uh, 210 miles an hour that day. It, um, I don't know the precise speed, but that's the uh, recollection I have. And uh, Lake Bonnie itself, um, I believe there was some uh, difficulties in, in the size of Lake Bonnie that weren't really helping Donald Campbell to set his world uh, water speed record. What was the, is the actual longest section in Lake Bonnie? Well, to the best of my knowledge, Four and one eighth miles uh, is the longest distance you can get out of Lake Bonnie, point to point. And obviously they selected the longest they could to fit uh, an appropriate... Well, I think it was perhaps a little bit of a compromise on that. Uh, the sighting and location of the timing equipment must have had some bearing on it because they had to uh, set the course to be parallel with that. So that may not have given them the actual longest piece of water that was available. And roughly how long did it take for um, the team and yourself to, to uh, move the course and for you to verify the accuracy? Oh, about, uh, from memory, about an hour. So it was only a matter of taking a bearing and then um, them moving their, their uh, boys appropriately and then uh, doing a recheck. And uh, about what time would you have finished that? Uh, Roughly about 11 o'clock or so. 11 o'clock? Yeah, 11, perhaps 11.30. And um, after you'd done this work, um, how uh, were you engaged with the group? Uh, well, um, Donald was there when we finished uh, and uh, he said, uh, asked me if I'd like to go up for a flight with him in the a afternoon. He had an Aero Commander uh, aeroplane over on the local strip. Said he was going up, would I like to come for the ride? And uh, at that time, uh, uh, if I had flown, it was only a little joy flight. I, don't, I think that might well have been the first time I was in an aeroplane. But uh, most certainly I said, thank you. <laughs> Uh, he just wandered around the river valley, uh, more or less having a look about. Um, I think he was interested in uh, what was going on more than anything else. But, but he did, at the end of the day, uh, line up his aeroplane with the reset course. And he flew along that course a lot lower than the trees out on the eastern side. I remember looking out and thinking, God, it's true. And we were just about down on the water. And uh, from where I was sitting in the plane, I could, was sitting one back and across from Donald, who was flying the plane. I could see the airspeed indicator. It was registering 180 knots. I did some rapid arithmetic, and that was very, very close to his 210 miles an hour. Um, uh, that alone was interesting because the uh, you know the trees on the eastern side were skipping by pretty well, and even though they were, you know, some distance away, but uh, uh, you know you they talk about uh, having your bum on the water. Well, certainly he did that day. So effectively, on that uh, day in November 1964, we could say that you. Um, did a very similar thing to Donald Campbell, only you weren't in the dangerous spot of being in the Bluebird, but you experienced essentially what it would have been like for him to, to do that speed across Lake Bonnie. Well, I suppose, um, yeah, he was, uh, it, was, it would have been a lot safer where I was than where Donald was, <laughs> without a doubt. I wouldn't like to be on water traveling at that speed. Mm, a bit hairy, I would imagine. And uh, of course, as you come to roughly towards where we're sitting now, um, there's a heap of trees that you'd have been below the line of those trees. What happened once you got towards uh, near them? Well, where I was sitting, I have this clear recollection of Donald as he came towards the town, uh, half turning around, looking over his right shoulder and saying, hang on, we're going up. 
and he, I guess he needed a thousand, fifteen hundred feet, something like that, over the town. And um, I recall that uh, the plane seemed to me as though it was hanging on the propellers as he pulled up to go up over the town. It would have been one big buzz, I would imagine. I just, uh, again, thanked me for what I'd done in the morning uh, to check their, uh, their bearings. Uh, he gave me a pass for the bluebird shed and uh, said, oh, any time you like, just wander down. Uh, it was something I never used. Um, I always felt that um, they had work to do. They didn't want people down there simply rubbernecking. Um, I, much as I would have liked to, it, but it uh, just didn't seem to me that it was the right thing to do. And uh, I think uh, earlier on we'd had some discussions about your experiences uh, and you mentioned that you also had a chance meeting with uh, one of Donald Campbell's uh, team. Yeah, well, he's head mechanic, a chap called Leo Villa, uh, was down the yacht club one morning. I had gone down there for whatever purpose, I don't recall, um, and uh, just started chatting to him and finished up in his motel room having a cup of coffee with him. I was interested in talking about Bluebird or something similar. He was interested in finding out a little bit about the district. But, uh, um, yeah, it was just one of those um, spur of the moment things that happen. What is your most enduring memory of your involvement with Donald Campbell here at Lake Bonnie? Oh, without a doubt, flying across the lake and Donald half turning and looking over his right shoulder and saying, hang on, we're going up. And without, that's the thing I recall most about Donald Campbell.